So, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Itzik Ben Gan, and I'm with uh, Solid Q. Um, you know, on my way in, uh, the gentleman at the entrance gave me this evaluation form, so I picked it up, and <laughs> I actually already filled it, you know, just to save some time. So, uh, the topic for the session uh, is essentially looking at all kinds of uh, capabilities in the language in T-SQL, uh, some kind of behaviors that uh, it's not a clear cut to tell whether they are uh, designed or by design behavior or whether they are actually bugs. And always there's the question if the behavior is by design, at least according to the standard SQL language, is it still considered a correct uh, behavior versus is it a bug? So I need your help here and I verified here that no one has the slide deck ahead and that's good because it would kind of uh, miss the whole point here. So I'll present certain uh, behavior. We'll look at the result of some querying logic, and then uh, we'll make a vote, basically, with every item. Who thinks it's a feature? Who thinks it's a bug? There's, as usual, three-valued logic in the crowd, so uh, always more than half are kind of uh, nulls. But we will need a vote here. So no nulls. There will be either a bug or a feature, all right? Uh, how many here attended my seminar from Tuesday? All right, so uh, the first couple of items for you would be testing your knowledge, all right? Then we'll start developing on top of those more fundamental items, uh, getting into deeper kind of uh, areas. Uh, I, I tried to design the session to fit in about 75 minutes so that we will have uh, 15 minutes left at the end. So if there are any questions planned, then uh, hopefully we will have some time left for those. All right, so we start with a reuse of column aliases. Looking at a query that looks like a very kind of straightforward query, we're trying to query a sales order table, returning only those rows where the order year is greater than some year, 2006. We go ahead, run this query, and get the following output. We will actually do this in the uh, code. Actually, I'm not after connecting to SQL Azure. You know, that's just a, a mouse down arrow. And connecting to our sample database. I'm running the following query. And of course, the intuitive thing for us to expect is we want to see only those orders placed after the year 2006. But then we get an arrow saying invalid column name. And then referring to the column name or the year. Now the question is, Bug or feature? So how many people think it is a bug? No, how many think it is a bug? How many think it's a feature? Oh, wow. That's I have to say at first. You know, usually it's kind of the other way around. How many uh, uh, don't have uh, an idea? Niles? I said not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> so can anyone, uh, can anyone name the property of the language that makes this kind of behavior a feature, actually? Yes. All right, excellent. So the, the gentleman over here, your name? John. So what John says is that the language uh, actually evaluates the where clause uh, before it evaluates the select clause. And the, the name for this kind of behavior is what the language calls a logical query processing. You know, there's so much confusion around this uh, concept of uh, ordering in the language in many different respects. There's, for one, the order in which we type our queries. So when we go and phrase the query, we start by typing the select clause first. We move on to the from, and then we move on to the where, and then a group by, and then a having, and then an order by. So we type things in this order, but then the language interprets or evaluates the different clauses in entirely different order. The language actually interprets the clauses, starting with the from clause, where we indicate the tables that we want to query, as well as what's known in the language as table operators, like you know joins, like apply, pivot, unpivot. Then we move on to filtering the data. Then we move on to grouping the data if we need to. Then handling filters of groups. And only then, what uh, shows almost at the end of the evaluation of the different clauses, we end up with the select clause, and then finally, also handle the ordering side of things. So for one, there's this discrepancy between the keyed in order of the clauses versus the logical query processing order. And if that's not 
confusing enough, there's also the issue of how the engine will go and interpret our query. So uh, whenever I, I get into the explanation of why the discrepancy between key in order and logical query processing order, and then always some people interpret this as if that's also going to be the physical processing order from the database engine. So there's actually also a third order, if you will, that's optimization order. The engine will take our code, will go and figure out what's the quickest way uh, out of at least the possibilities that it evaluates to go and process stuff. And in cases where it can go and rearrange elements like if there's an inner join and a where clause, the, the optimizer knows that evaluating the filter first will not really change the meaning of the result, so it can always start actually with the filters using indexing and so on and so on. So three different orders. Kid in order, then logical query processing order, and then there's optimization order, let's say. Uh, interesting to see other languages like uh, Link that uh, design the, the interpretation order, the evaluation order, uh, more like logical query processing order and not uh, more like English order, which is how SQL is designed. All right. Anyway, for more computerized people, let's say, probably uh, using a language that starts with a from clause would be more intuitive for just humans, let's say. It's probably more convenient to think with select first, from next, and so on. So anyway, we have an answer for our first item. That's a feature. Moving on to the next one. Now we're trying something similar, but not in a different clause. Right? Now we're trying to go refer to an alias that we defined within the select list in the immediate next expression that appears to the right of it. So I'm querying an orders table, and I'm looking for a, both the order year for each order extracted from the order date, and then I'm looking also for some computation based on our order year alias. We're going and uh, running the query, expecting to see just valid results set. And then what we get is another error. So first of all, before we talk about why this happens, how many think that this behavior is a bug? How many think that this behavior is a feature? All right. How many uh, nulls? Oh, as usual over there. OK. We'll, we'll, we'll talk later <laughs> after the break. So this is, in fact, a feature. But can anyone name the property of the language that makes this a feature? All at once, all right? All at once. So uh, SQL is very, very unique in many respects. If you compare it with other uh, programming languages, there are so many aspects that are very, very unique to SQL. Some of them uh, kind of evolved from uh, the mathematical foundations or are, are related to the mathematical foundations uh, of the language. At any rate, uh, SQL implements a concept called all at once. Uh, that says that all expressions that appear in the same logical query processing phase, the from phase, the select phase, the where phase, the having phase, and so on, are conceptually evaluated at the same point in time. And again, here I'm stressing conceptually, because we always make some kind of uh, a, a wrong assumptions about what physically the engine will end up doing versus what the logical design of the language defines. So standard SQL that defines the language based on its mathematical foundations, the relational model, which is based on set theory and predicate logic, defines the correctness of our request. W what uh, is supposed to be the outcome of this request if we interpret it based on the logical uh, definition of the various steps uh, uh, that, that evaluate the query? Then what the engine will do, it will do, but it will have to match the logical meaning of the request. So always the, the logical request will define the correctness and what would lead to, to the final output. And then the engine will have to do whatever it can, but come up with the result defined by that logical process. And then it can do it any way it likes, basically. So with the all at once concept, if all expressions that participate in the same logical query processing phase, like here in the select phase, happen conceptually at the same point in time, then it shouldn't matter which we put to the left and which we put to the right. Unlike in most programming languages where uh, you define some expression and get the result, you can now take this result and use it in the following expression. Right? So it's in a way decomposable or indivisible uh, uh, what happens in the same phase. So therefore, we are not yet allowed to refer to this order year 
within an expression that appears to the right of it. All right? Now, this is a very simplistic kind of uh, implication of the all-at-once concept. They are far more kind of complicated and, and more sophisticated, let's say, a, a outcomes that can cause us eventually basically to write incorrect code. Here, at least, our query will fail. If we run it and attempt to refer to that alias, the query simply fails. Other cases, we can simply end up with logical bugs where we write something with some intention and not realizing that the language behaves in this manner, we simply get different results, right? So anyway, that's reuse of column aliases. Now let's look at other implications of the all at once. So we have the following query, right? Uh, we implement this kind of concept of dynamic schema, very typical need. We need to maintain, uh, say, object properties. All the time we keep getting new objects and different objects have different properties. So, you know, we can get new a, a, a property types all the time. So we use what's known in this uh, context of dynamic schema or open schema, a, a model known as the entity attribute value, or in short, EAR. And in this model, we keep instead of one row per object, which is the more classic kind of modeling, we keep one row per each object attribute value. So if a certain object has 10 applicable properties, we keep them in 10 different rows, basically. And the value attribute, usually people use either a character string or an SQL variant a, a, a data type that can hold within it whatever is the base element. But then we keep in another kind of attribute, what is the uh, nature of the value? Is it a number? Is it a date? Is it a character string? And so on. Now imagine that we want to operate only on the uh, integer uh, properties. So we go apply a filter that says select from properties where the type is in one of our integer types, tiny, int, small, int, big, int, and so on and so on. And then assuming that the language supports a short circuit concept, much like other languages such as C, if we have some kind of a, a predicate or if we have a logical expression followed by end and then another logical expression, if the first logical expression evaluates to false, we already get short circuiting of the, the activity and then there's no real reason to go and uh, process the second expression. So our assumption is, of course, that this query will simply run correctly and return only those applicable properties after also doing the casting of the property into a big integer type that will hold any of the uh, smaller types and then uh, matching whatever predicate greater than zero. So we go ahead and run the code. Let's go ahead and implement this uh, properties table, fill it with some rows. We go ahead and run the code. Before we talk about bug or feature, how many think that this code will run successfully? Maybe it's a tricky question, by the way, that uh, no one expects that it will run successfully. OK, how many think it will fail? OK, how many nulls? <laughs> All right, so the list uh, of people that will, uh, we will need to talk to uh, after the, the session will grows and grows. So running the code, and then the code says, error converting data type bar chart to begin. So first of all, the behavior is a bug or a feature. How many think it's a bug? All right, how many think it's a feature? All right, I will spare the part with the NAS for now. So turns out that it is a perfectly valid feature. And the very same property of the language that we just discussed that had kind of more simplistic implications now have a bit trickier implications. So the fact that everything that appears in the same logical query processing phase is evaluated at the same point in time means that the engine, if it likes, it can start with the right expression. If it has some capabilities of actually evaluating the two expressions really at the same point in time, it technically can. So even though I can tell you that in SQL Server, usually such expressions will not be evaluated truly at the same point in time, but what will more likely happen is that even though the engine does support a physical concept of short circuiting, so SQL Server, if it starts with the type in predicate, and it figures that in a certain case we have a false, it won't go and physically bother evaluating the second expression. So it truly has a concept of short circuiting that saves cycles, basically. Uh, but the way it decides uh, which predicate to start with is usually cost driven. So using a cost based optimizer, it can evaluate our predicates and figure, you know what, we have a predicate that has 
some index to support it versus one that doesn't, let's start with the one that will just very likely give us a more efficient you know, processing of the query. Yeah, question? OK, so the question, would it work if I use a subquery? So uh, those that participated in my seminar explained these two terms that the speakers tend to use in response to questions. Uh, one, uh, let's test if you remember what was the, when, 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 when the speaker says it's a good question, what does it mean? Doesn't know the answer. And when the speaker says it's an excellent question, the answer is in the next slide. Excellent. So this was an excellent question. All right? So we'll get to it in, in the, the very next item. So for now, perfectly valid as far as both standard SQL is concerned and SQL Server is concerned to start actually with the second predicate. And if it doesn't fail, it doesn't mean that it will be guaranteed never to fail. You realize? So just in this particular case, we caught an example where due to cost estimates, the optimizer says, I'll actually start with the second one and then move on to the first one. So we ended up actually converting first and therefore uh, failing, basically. All right? So here's our next item. So just like the suggestion, what if we use a subquery? Just the same, we could use a view or any form of a table expression, right? So we go encapsulate the logic in, in this case, a view that says, here are only the integer properties. So conceptually, the logic here happens in the inner query. And as far as we are concerned, the integer properties is a relation, or in SQL Server, a view, that happens to be defined by a query. But the view, much like any other table, is supposed to represent a relation for us. Right? So as far as the outer query is concerned, we're already past that point where we filtered out non-integer elements. The view is truly supposed to represent for us only integer properties. So let's go ahead and create the uh, environment. Yes, yeah, so the question is, can I use CTE? Same concept. So remember, there's a view, CTE, a derived table, inline a, a table valued function. All four object types are what you can think of as table expressions, that they are basically, in a way, relations defined by a query that we kind of encapsulate and then name. Right? So as far as, as, as our example is concerned, for all four cases, the behavior should be the same. Now I'm going and running my query. And how many think it's going to fail? How many think it will work fine? How many in the third category? What's going on there? You're not listening. That's, that's now my test to know if you're listening or not. All right, so we run the code and it fails. So with this in mind, what we're looking at is how many think a bug how many think a feature? All right, so see, most people think it's a feature. It is a bug, finally, a surprise, I see, because so far you, you're perfect in uh, estimating whether it's a bug or a feature. So as far as standard SQL is concerned, it is a perfectly uh, uh, invalid uh, kind of behavior. It's a bug because, yeah, question? Uh, the question is whether it's related to order of precedence Order of precedence of what? I mean, it, 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 yeah, so the question is whether it's related to data type precedence, and the answer is no, completely unrelated. It's not like we have two different types for the elements, and the one we didn't think gets implicitly converted, completely unrelated, yeah? The reality is this. First of all, as far as standard SQL is concerned, what's the correct behavior? The inner query is supposed to define the relation that we call integer properties and has to go through all of its logical query processing phases to define that relation. And then the outer query is supposed to operate on an already created relation. So why is it that we still get an error? Because for performance reasons, what SQL Server does, as well as, by the way, other leading database platforms with complete awareness of the possibility for this outcome, all of them, almost without exception, will kind of unnest or unpack the inner queries logic in order to be able to get a better plan. Basically, after we unnest the inner queries logic and behind the scenes, what we end up getting is, as you can imagine, this, basically, after the unnesting, 
This means that internally SQL Server doesn't have to. Is there a question there? Yeah, so the question is whether the bug was in the query or in SQL Server. So as mentioned, as far as the standard SQL language is concerned, the behavior is a bug. It's not supposed to fail. So the bug is specifically in SQL Server. It's not like a bug in, in obviously, standard SQL defines logical behavior of the language. The correctness, a, a, as far as the standard is concerned, never supposed to fail in this case. Always the inner query is supposed to complete first. Then the outer query is supposed to start with the result relation. Another question? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what if I created a filtered index that somehow filtered only the interesting uh, types, let's say? Would it then use it uh, and avoid this kind of uh, failure? So the answer is, it could, but the point being that we need to make, as far as the relational model is concerned, a complete separation between the logical layer and the physical layer. There's a concept called physical data independence. The logical layer defines the correctness. And we are failing it now. Yeah, we could do all kinds of physical things to avoid it, but still they are never truly guaranteed. As long as it's a matter of optimization, uh, you never have 100% assurance. You know, what if in certain circumstances, the optimizer finds a case where it thinks that another option is more sensible. So we need a, a, a physical data independence. And here, due to physical reasons, the unnesting logic, we end up with simply incorrect behavior. Now, it's not like we get incorrect result. It's that the query fails when, according to the standard, it shouldn't fail. Another question there? Yes, the question is, if you do a no expand, will it still do it? No expand is relevant only to indexed views. There's nothing to do. I wish there was some kind of a hint like no expand that allows us to force it to first complete the inner you know, part and then start working with the outer. But again, all of those are different kind of options. What if I created this kind of element or that kind of element or this kind of hint or that kind of hint? The behavior is simply a bug. Right? We'll soon get to how do we guarantee that it will never fail, but no doubt it's a bug and not one of those bugs that are unintentional. This is a completely intentional bug, not that... Microsoft wants your code to fail, obviously, but the intention is not related to the bug, it's more to get better performance. So that our queries against table expressions, instead of first physically processing the inner query to completion and then somehow keeping the result in some internal walk table and then operating on it, will very likely end up with much worse performance. So the capability here is more to get better performance and in the 99.9% .9 of the cases that do not fail, we gain from this. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the question is whether we try the filtered index to do this. Uh, we had already this question uh, covered here. And the, the answer is that, again, it's some kind of physical uh, addition that may or may not work, you know. But still, it won't be 100% guaranteed that it will always go and use this kind of physical strategy. All right? Logically, it should never, ever fail according to the standard. So, at any rate, I'm saying it is a bug, but not an unintentional one. In a way, it's a bug by design, so maybe we should call it a feature, kind of a combination of bug or a feature. We need some kind of a name, you know. There's bug that's not by design that we keep calling a bug, but bug by design is perhaps a feature. Another option I was thinking about is creepy crawly feature, or in, in short, with one word, a creature. So now we have a name for bugs by design. Bugs by design are simply creatures. It will be uh, easy to track. Anyway, before we move on to our next item, uh, there's a very uh, interesting way to get around this. So th there were suggestions like filtered indexes and all kinds of uh, options like this. But all of those are not 100% guaranteed. It's just we're kind of hoping and assuming it's very likely that the optimizer will do this or will do that. Any suggestion that will never fail? Okay, so, so actually we had already the correct uh, uh, answer, which is using a case expression. Uh, case expressions turned out, and this actually also documented in uh, uh, books online, case expressions evaluate their uh, when clauses in written order, physically. That's guaranteed. 
Recently, by the way, a certain uh, bug was discovered when it doesn't always happen in this manner, but let's say for the majority of the cases, uh, it is supposed to work like this, and that's what Microsoft uh, uh, documents. So how do we solve this basically with the uh, case expression? So we can always go ahead and write a, a select from our table, and then have in a case expression, A when close, the checks only the cases where our element is in one of those, you know, interesting integer types. So when the property type is in, and then we start listing the options, you know, big integer, small integer, and so on and so on. Then we can go and return a result like a return the value else return a null. Now, we never get to return the value when the element is not one of those integer properties. We simply never return that value. We just return a null. And always when we go and try to do anything with a null, convert it to any type, of course, always the conversion will be successful. All right? So anyway, just based on this assumption that when closes and the respective then are always going to be evaluated in written order, Relying on this fact, we can actually fix our problem. So here's our new integer properties uh, a view that, as you can see, goes and checks with the case expression if our type is one of those elements that are considered integer types, then go and return the value even including the casting already to a numeric a type, because now we know it is safe to do so. We never get into this then clause if we're not one of the integer types. And then in all other cases, simply return a null. So we know that even if by any chance we end up trying to convert what is not convertible, we will try to convert a null to any other type that will eventually anyway get filtered out based on our logic. All right? So with this in mind, we go ahead, recreate our view, and then as you can see, it works perfectly well. We could do this also immediately in the original query, but if you need a view to represent integer properties, now we have a solution. Also a nice a, a solution that we get in SQL Server Denali that makes our lives so much easier, and that's in the form of a new function called try convert. And you know, Denali includes many, many very nice features that in, uh, involved quite a lot of investment from Microsoft's perspective, you know, window functions and the sequences and uh, so on. This one obviously wasn't that big of an investment, but for so many people, it's an extremely, extremely powerful tool. It will allow us now, uh, in such a simple way, deal with all of those cases. I even thought of creating, uh, you know, one of those uh, life is good uh, shirts that just says uh, try convert, life is good. So how do we do this in SQL Server Denali? Then in the select list, instead of going into th those complexities with the case, we simply say, try convert to big int val. If it's not convertible, it does return a null. So trying again, obviously, the thing simply will not fail. Very, very similar situation uh, that you will get when you need to deal with other kinds of manipulations that, never mind if it's not a conversion error, it could be any other kind of error. So imagine a situation where we need to query rows from some table, and then in the where clause say, I need to return only those rows where column one divided by column two satisfies some kind of a condition, right? Maybe this needs to be greater than 10. Reality, though, is that column two, in some cases, could be null, uh, sorry, could be zero. And we don't want the query to fail on the divide by zero error. So we're back into the same kind of trickiness, yeah? How do we solve this? Well, in many languages, in languages such as C, what you would do is you would say where column two is different than zero and, you know, the rest, because we're assuming a short circuit will take place in the first part if it's not true. Reality is, though, that SQL Server can start with a division, just like it started with a conversion. So how do we fix this? Well, same idea. What we could do is we could say, using a case expression, case when column two is in fact equal to zero, go and return a null. 
But if it's not equal to a zero, now we can go and check the other condition, right? So uh, if, if it's not zero, now you realize that we reach the second when close guaranteed that column two is one other than zero. So now the division will never fail. We can check if this is true, then return some flag that tells us we need to return that row, right? So say we return a one. And then in all other cases, we return a zero. And you could also return a one or a zero back from the first case, depending on whether you, for you, when column two is zero means you need to return the row versus you don't need to return the row. Uh, this way you can decide whether you need to put a one or a zero here. Let's say that when column two is a zero, we're not supposed to return the row. We don't want to try the division, but we also don't want to return the row. So now the outcome of the case expression is simply either one or zero. And the rest is simply now return only the cases where the outcome of the case expression is equal to one. For, one, one, for us, one is like saying return this, right? It would be nice, by the way, this is something that uh, Denali doesn't have, but you know, this try convert is such a beautiful concept. Why limit to only conversion errors? Why not have a function called try this? <laughs> so you have some kind of an expression, divide by or, or convert. This could be a far more universal type of function that internally implements, obviously, some kind of error handling logic, but simply returns a null when it's not doable, basically. Uh, maybe, maybe we should try and maybe a new connect item. Null if. Yeah, I mean, return a null, but internally it's like a case expression, right? And that's very specific to this case. So the suggestion Erland makes is, what if we use a null if? And then if it's equal to a zero, return a null and so on. But that's, again, something that would work for this very particular case. I'm saying, why not capture any kind of a trappable error? Of course, I'm not talking about non-trappable errors, but trappable error created by an expression and then simply convert it to a null and then we can easily deal with all of those cases. Maybe we'll open a connect item. We'll see. Maybe if someone can during the session. I know everyone is tweeting all the time, so go open a connect item. Anyway, our next item. Still, we're in the same topic of all at once. We have the following uh, statement. The statement uh, goes and assigns values to two columns, column one and column two. The starting point of our data, as you can see, is in the row of interest. Column one is zero, column two is zero. Now we assign to T1 in T1 to column one the value of column one plus 10, which obviously will assign it with the value 10. And then we want to assign to column two the result of the manipulation that we applied to column one. So how many expect to see in column two the value 10? How many expect to see the value three? <laughs> I know everyone was already prepared to raise their hand. How many expect zero? All right, excellent. So this is what we get. Let's go ahead and run it and uh, see. Fill the data. Then go ahead and run the code. And as you can see, we got a zero. But you know, now that we understand the concept of all at once, it's kind of perfectly clear. All of the elements that we're looking at are uh, evaluated at the same point in time. And therefore, we are looking at the values before the assignments whenever we are pulling them from uh, the, the uh, right side of the assignment. So as if everything that appears to the right side of the assignment is pulled from what you can think of as the source table in the operation, and everything that appears to the left of the assignment uh, as if represents elements from the target. And then after we finish populating the target, at least conceptually, I'm not saying it works physically like this, at least conceptually as if we kind of substitute the source with the target. For the same reason, by the way, when we want to go and perform some kind of a swapping of column values between two columns in a table, for many people it seems extremely counterintuitive what, what we're about to look at, but the way we swap column values is simply by saying set column one is equal to column two, and column two is equal to column one. Of course, very counterintuitive if we're thinking in procedural terms where expressions get evaluated from left to right, because you always need this kind of temporary variable uh, storing the value of the first element and then overwriting and then storing with whatever we stored in a temporary variable. I like to give this exercise in uh, uh, my T-SQL classes, and it's amazing to see the solutions that students come up with 
uh, one uh, very beautiful solution, uh, not my intention, but you know, still worked, was to use a delete statement uh, that says delete from T1 using an output clause with into that kind of inserts the, the column values in exact reverse order. So the end result is obviously that we get the column swap, but of course not the original intention. So I changed the phrasing of the exercise to write an update statement. Uh, another uh, common uh, kind of suggestion is let's uh, do SP rename three times and end up with the column values renamed. <laughs> so at some point I just changed the phrasing, write an update statement then. So anyway, very, very interesting implications of the language. So, oh, I missed this uh, kind of uh, part. Okay, so it's a feature, as you could uh, guess. Anyway, our next item, very, very similar concept, right? We're declaring a couple of variables. We have a variable i, we have a variable j. Then assigning to the first variable the result of its current value plus 10, assigning to the second variable the value from the first variable, but using a select statement, as you can see, right? How many expect to get 0 in j? How many expect to get 0 in j? How many expect to get? 10 in J. All right, we have quite a lot of people left. How many are uncertain? All right, so now we've moved to four-valued logic. Uh, <laughs> still, the sum of everyone is about half, I would say. Let's try. Uh, we got 10. We got 10, and I mean, at least according to the all at once concept, we expected to get a zero because we're supposed to look at the value before the assignment, not after the assignment from the first expression. So with this in mind, how many think the result that we got is a bug? How many think it's a feature? All right, we still have half kind of uncertain. But anyway, it is a bug. It is a bug. The select must operate in an all-at-once manner. And the reason that now it behaves like this is just for historical reasons. You know, some point when it was initially implemented, this was the defined behavior, not following the standard. Yeah? Right. So in six, as Erland mentions, in SQL Server 6.5 and earlier, it actually worked correctly. And then somehow, someone probably reported this as a bug, not realizing that there is this all-at-once concept and it's not supposed to uh, change, you know, the behavior. And probably at some point they change it and then for backward compatibility and all of those usual reasons, they just didn't change it. So that's a bug. And very unlikely that uh, it will change. I mean, I, I don't know, but very unlikely that the behavior will, will change since, seven, uh, since uh, you said 6.0 or 6.5 was the last time when it worked correctly. Ah, so they missed it in 7.0, okay. So anyway, this is a bug. Question. Yeah. Yeah, same idea. So the question is if we use the compound assignment operators, you know, the ones that were added in SQL Server 2008, so if we do plus equal 10, it's just syntactical uh, difference. There's no difference in the meaning. So it's perf perfect bug, basically, I'm afraid, uh, uh, but uh, that's how it is. All right, so anyway, moving on to SQL Server Denali. Now things become even trickier when expressions can do things that are normally in the domain of activities that modify stuff, right? So uh, how many had the chance already to play with the sequence object in SQL Server Denali? Sequence object? How many heard of it? Or, okay, so uh, sequences, uh, for those that are not familiar with those, are uh, essentially independent objects in the database that uh, generate numbers that we usually use as keys, right? Uh, they are added in SQL Server Denali uh, to uh, give us more flexible solutions to sequencing needs than the identity column property. Identity has a whole array of uh, limitations and restrictions. Uh, things like the fact that we can attach a, an identity property to a column, but along with the column that we define in the table, we cannot assign it to an existing column or remove it from an existing column. Uh, 
Uh, also, identity is tied to a particular column in a particular table, and sometimes we need our sequences to be generated in a way that we will use the keys across you know, different tables. Often we need to generate our new keys before we use them, and not first insert, then go and ask what was the newly generated key. So those are just a couple of examples where identity simply in many ways limits us. So a sequence is a standard solution, basically. It's already for quite a while there in standard SQL. is a concept that says, like identity, it's a mechanism that generates new keys, but it's an independent object in the database. And as such, it's not tied to any particular table or any particular column. Whenever we need a new value, we just ask for it. We say select, and the expression is a little bit awkward, but you know, it's just a matter of getting used to. We say select next value four, and then the name of the sequence. So uh, let's do this. First of all, let's go ahead and create a sequence. Uh, let me do this in a different window, maybe. We're generating a new sequence. All right, so create sequence. A sequence name. We'll give it a data type. So now let's do a little test of those that attended the seminar. If I don't uh, indicate a data type, what is the type that we're going to get by default? No, no, we're not, we're not asking the, what's the bottom value. What's the type? Big integer. All right, so the default type is a big integer. We're usually not interested in a big integer. Generally, it can be any numeric type that has a scale of a zero. Uh, we tried, yes, uh, on Tuesday, by the way, bit. It didn't work, even though uh, the documentation actually refers to bit as an integer type. But anyway, with bit, it doesn't work, but I doubt that anyone would ever need the, such a sequence for a bit. But anyway, if we don't indicate a type, we get a big integer. So if we need an integer, we will be explicit about this. And then we indicate what value we want to start with, and as the gentleman over there said, if we don't indicate an initial value, the initial value is not one, which is the, the natural expectation, but rather according to standard SQL, it's supposed to be the lowest value in the time. So this is minus two billion and whatever is the lowest value within the time. Uh, sometimes it doesn't really matter for us whether the keys are negative or positive, and then really why not use the entire range, but you know, sometimes it does matter, even in terms of how it looks, you know, sometimes it, when it looks with all of those negatives, it, it, it can cause all kinds of kind of tricky situations. Uh, anyway, we will indicate that we want our uh, sequence to start with one. We will also indicate what to increment by. So we have a sequence called sequence one, and whenever we need a new value, we say select, and here comes the expression, basically, or the function that requests a new value from the sequence. We say next, value four, and now we indicate the name of the sequence. So, give me the first value, the second value, the third value, and so on and so on, right? So, our last value is nine in this example. Now, we're about to ask for two new sequence values. Let's call the first one value one, the second one value two. Now, before I run this, how many think that value two will be <laughs> 10, I guess you. How many think it will be 11? All right, that's most people. 10. Now the question is, is what we're looking at a bug? The fact that we get 10 in the second value. How many think it's a bug? How many think it's a feature? All right, so what's the property that uh, makes it a 10? All at once, all right? It just follows the exact same semantics. It is supposed to produce the same value because it is an expression. A creature, no, it's not a creature. It's not a bug. It's according to standard SQL supposed to work like this. It's not a creature. Both the standard and SQL server just implement correct behavior. Yes? The question is, why don't we expect two 11s? Because the expression is conceptually evaluated only once. That's why, and since it's evaluated only once, we are supposed to get the immediate next value after 9. So I think the, the, the natural thing according to all at once semantics is supposed to be 10. Yeah. Mm 
Yeah, so there, there's a slightly unrelated question, but it's okay. Uh, 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 whether it rolls back, if the transaction rolls back and the answer is the same as identity, namely no. So it's a kind of a sequencing mechanism that will not guarantee no gaps. Right? But we can continue offline if you have kind of further questions about the idea. All right, moving on. Question. Yes, the question is, if I ran this again, will it be a... Thir no, you're asking not 13, 12, I guess. Let me rephrase your question. If we run it again, <laughs> will it be 12? What do you think? How many think it will be 12? 11, 11. All right. The expression is atomic. Never mind how many times we refer to it. All right? So, yeah, question? Yeah, so if we look at the query execution plan, Right, so you see a compute scalar and the expression. You see that does a get next from the sequence, expression 1000, then just, you know, present it twice, which is how it's supposed to work. All right, yeah, another question. Right. So the gentleman here says that he still insists that it's a bug or <laughs> fails. And I hear you. But uh, according both to standard SQL and just SQL Server's implementation of how the standard defines things, it's an expression. And as such, it's supposed to uh, uh, be evaluated only once per the query. All right. So, you know, I, I first time when, when I saw this, I thought it was a bug as well. And not in a select. I just went and defined, you know, a Microsoft SQL Server enhances the sequence capabilities to more than what standard SQL defines as well as more than what competitors do. So uh, only in SQL Server you can define a default constraint. A default constraint. Um, and by the way, there was a question in, on Tuesday about not for application, so a default constraint can be defined with not for application, right? So we covered that part. Yeah, yeah, so actually the answer is yes, but we, we will continue this offline. I'm sorry about the small digression. It's just something I kind of remembered. So going back to our original uh, uh, point, you define two default expressions for two different columns, and within both default expressions, say, next value for same sequence object, you will get the same value in both because of the all-at-one semantics. And this, to me, seemed like a certain bug. But then when I sent to... Uh, uh, Tobias and uh, UC from uh, the Microsoft dev team, they are, they are the ones that uh, create all of the beautiful things we get in T-SQL. Uh, they said something along the lines of, you always talk about the all at once. You know, why, why should you expect uh, this to behave differently? Yeah. In get, I, oh, you mean new ID? No, new ID, actually, if... The, the one's difference in behavior, I don't remember between which two versions, but if we do select new ID and then another new ID, all right? So as you can see, we get different values, but according to standard SQL, it is supposed to be a bug, uh, but one of those bugs that uh, I guess they would refer to as a creature or they would refer to as a bug by design. But uh, what's interesting is this, that if we name it as something, like uh, let's say value, and then put this in a table expression and do select from, and then this table expression, let's call it D, and then ask for value as val1 and value as val2. So how many here expect to get the same value? How many different? All right, so we get the same value. And the true answer is it depends on which version you are running. Because, <laughs> yeah, because... At certain, I don't remember the exact version, but there was ver a version where it actually produced two different values, and that's certainly a bug, right? So, you know, why, when we call it twice, uh, uh, we don't get the same value back, to me, is a bug as long as we're thinking about the all at once. But at least this part, very clearly, is supposed to produce the same value twice. Yeah. Yeah, so with get date, same concept. Same concept as the new ID. But, uh, you know, to get, to get uh, the question was about get date. 
do we get the same value or not? It behaves basically the same way as new ID. Same thing with RAND. Uh, it's supposed to return the same value according to the, the all at once semantics, but uh, I believe that it works like the new ID if you call it wise within the query. All right, but something that needs to be verified. But you know, it needs to be such timing uh, to get different values, at least from the get date. Let's try with the RAND. Just out of curiosity, what happens with a RAND when we do it outside? And then run as val2. All right, so yeah, as you can see, it behaves the same way as new ID. It's not supposed to, but it does. But at least if we encapsulate it in a table expression, then we are now guaranteed, at least in last couple of versions, the behavior. All right, so anyway, that's the concept of a, a select twice next value four. How about a... Actually, I want to show another uh, uh, example just to conclude this part about the, uh, the sequences. How about if we do this? First of all, let's see what's the last value. So last value is 12. The next one we're supposed to generate is 13. Yeah? How about if we go and generate two variables? Right? And now we say select i equals val a next value for whatever, and then j equals next value for. And now we go and say, show me i and j. So before I run it, how many think we will get in both 13? How many think we will get in both 13? How many think we will get in 113 and in 114? How many think there will be a different outcome? <laughs> no one? I think there will be a different outcome, but let's see. It failed. Yes. And now it depends actually on the CTP you're working with. <laughs> CTP1, CTP1, you actually got different values because of the bug that we have with select variable equals that doesn't follow the all at once semantics even though it's supposed to. And we had this kind of uh, interesting uh, thread uh, started by some kind of a puzzle that I posted in a private group. And someone, I don't remember who it was, but someone came up with, I gave a puzzle, write a query that generates two different values from the same sequence. And any kind of attempts that you would try with encapsulating a table expression, simply the language doesn't allow it. And people came up with all kinds of attempts, and the only ones that worked were due to bugs. So one of those that worked was actually the one with the select variable and so on. Now, at the moment, Microsoft probably won't change the behavior uh, due to some expectations that maybe existing uses have, but they didn't need to allow this with sequences because there's a completely new capability in the language. So moving from CTP1 to CTP3, they simply disabled you know, the capability of doing it from the same sequence into variables. So no one would complain, but how come I don't get the same value while in a normal select I do? Yeah. What if we have a two, two get date? So this would basically behave the same way as I showed the, uh, with the new ID. Yeah, it could technically be different. With get date, it's, you know, it's need to be such a, a fantastic timing in order for us to see different values. But technically, just like with the new ID, if I go in the sign, uh, of course, it will be very hard to show this with get date. But if I do, uh, let's say, as float, and then I go and say, select rand, this should mimic basically other non-deterministic functions. All right, and as you can see, we get two different values. Even though we're not supposed to, we're getting two different values. All right, so this is one of those bugs. Anyway, moving on. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, situations where we do uh, some kind of uh, logical activities that involve uh, subqueries, and if we're not careful, we can very easily run into a lot of trouble, basically. So let's look at the first situation. We have a couple of tables, as you can see, T1 and T2. Uh, T1 observe has the values 1, 2, and 3. T2 
T2 has the value 2 alone. Right? We have a very basic query that says, give me all the values from T1, namely from here. Uh, I pressed the wrong button. It wasn't supposed to be a line. Let's try again. So give me all the values from T1 all right, that do not appear in the set of values. Oh, sorry, what am I saying? That do appear in the set of values in T2. In other words, simply show me the values that appear in T1 and also in T2. So we go ahead and run the query. What do we expect to see in the result? And those that don't see this, what do we expect to see in the result? <laughs> the what? So I, I heard one suggestion is to see an error, basically. And Erland, what is your suggestion? Well, so the, uh, Erland's answer is we should get all values from T1. How many agree? How many disagree? Wow, it's like 95% that are in the third category. So I actually agree with Erland, but let's see why. So I'm going, creating our tables, running the code. Let me just show also the table structures. And running the code, observe that we get all values back from T1. Now, why did you think that it was supposed to fail? All right. So observe the names of the columns in the two tables. In T1, the name of the column is column 1. In T2, the name of the column is column 2. And in the subquery, I'm referring to column 1 from T2 when such a column does not exist in T2. That's why, I guess, there was an expectation to get a, an error. But why didn't it fail? Erlen? All right, so unintentionally, it became a correlated subquery. Think about different column names. Maybe column 1, column 2 don't uh, 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 seem like... Uh, uh, they could get correlated, but think a table T1 that has a column called A and a table T2 that has a column called B, and in the inner query against T2, I want to, to refer to A. Do I have to prefix with a table name if it's not an ambiguous column name? No? Yes, yeah, so the question is, what if I use exists? That's an excellent question, and we'll get there in a moment, okay? <laughs> so, a... Uh, this unintentionally became a correlated subquery. Uh, basically, it's, it's as if we said when the value in T1 was 1, it's as if we said where 1 is in, select a 1 for each row from T2. And when the outer value was 2, it's as if we said select 2, uh, uh, where 2 in, select a 2 for each row from the inner table. So as long as there's at least one row in the inner table, we're always going to get a match. No, no, the question is, if we had two rows in T2, would we get six rows? The answer is no, because in looks for at least one match. It's not a join. It's not a join. The inner query, it doesn't matter how many cases of this value we have, as long as we, we have at least one match, and as long as there's at least one row in T2, we'll always have a match, as you can imagine. Unless the value is a null, of course, but uh, when it's not a null, that's the case. So think about a more realistic example where it's more likely to happen. We have a request that says, give me customers who placed orders. So select from customers, where cast ID in, select cast ID from orders, right? And that's an example like the question, what if I have more than one occurrence? Of course, I can have more than one occurrence of the same customer in the inner, you know, uh, table. But the thing is, we didn't follow best practices in terms of modeling that say, if an attribute represents the same thing in different relations, it's supposed to have the same name. And we didn't follow this recommendation. And, you know, uh, someone created a table customers and called the column cast ID, and someone created a table orders and called the column cast underscore ID. But the developer, when writing the code, didn't realize and used cast ID without an underscore in both cases. And completely unintentionally, we got into this mess. And by the way, in case-sensitive systems, it can be even worse. Because if in one, ta in one table it's called like this, cast ID, and in another table it's called cast ID like this, that's already enough to cause this kind of uh, trouble if we don't notice and we use the same name. So uh, best practices in this case, for one, in the long run, always, always name attributes that mean the same thing in different relations the same way. But that's something you do in the long run. We don't start going and changing, uh, you know, column names now across 
uh, the board, we need to do it slowly and carefully. Uh, but until then, what's a simple practice we can follow to avoid this problem? Always, always prefix, right? We qualify the table, the column with the table name, and then hopefully we don't make a mistake also in the table name. Uh, but as long as we are referring to the right table, then, of course, uh, we will get an error, and then we will fix it, all right? So anyway, the behavior is therefore, I would say it's a SQL feature, the behavior, because the, there's nothing wrong in terms of what the query does as far as the language is concerned. The language returns the correct result, or SQL server returns the correct result as far as the language is concerned. But it's more, I would say, a developer bug. You know, it's SQL feature, developer bug. Our next item. Yeah, yeah, yes. So, so quotes, how is it related to quotes? Yes, yeah, so if we ran the inner query alone, alone, obviously, there's no such column. But the thing is that the way the name resolution works is first look for it in the immediate, you know, a query. Then if you don't find it, look in the upper layer. That's completely valid behavior. That's intentional. That's as mentioned earlier, if we have cases where the column names are simply unambiguous, there's no reason for us not to allow references that don't include the prefix. Just like in a join. If you join two tables and you want to refer to a column that exists in only one of the two tables, nothing prevents you from referring to it without a prefix. Even though it's still a best pref practice to prefix, but at least if you don't, there you get an error saying ambiguous column name. Here, unlike in a join, there's no error, but rather the assumption is that if you didn't prefix, you probably meant it to come from the inner table, and only if it doesn't exist there, then you meant it to be resolved against the outer. Yeah, exactly. So if I called column three, now that's a different story. It doesn't exist in either table, so it does fail. But again, very simple practice. Always qualify the column name with the table name, and then you simply don't have to worry about any of those things. From, if we got rid of what? If we got rid of this feature, what do you mean, the language? <laughs> uh, what kind of feature? You mean the, the implicit resolution against the outer? You know, this is, of course, something you can argue about, but that ship has sailed already. So. There's not something that the standard SQL will ever change, obviously, because there's a lot of implementations out there that obviously rely on this behavior. But when it was first considered in the standard, if we had some representative sitting there, then there's a place to argue. I completely agree. And it's a valid argument to say, in a join, I can see this, because the two sides appear in the same kind of evaluation process. And then there's either an ambiguous column name or an unambiguous one. But in this case, you could say we're not allowing kind of implicit resolution. If it's not in the immediate table, just you know, don't allow it. But uh, again, that's already a matter of the past, so we cannot really change anything now. Yeah. Right, so, so I mean, of course, some of those things, uh, we could somehow uh, uh, create a program that would look for such problems. So there's a lot of potential here for uh, tools that do parsing of your logic uh, and this make suggestions. Certainly a, a room to identify this, because if the inner part, as you pass the inner query, you identify a column that doesn't appear in this table and it's not qualified, of course, you could go and somehow raise a certain warning. Perhaps that's not what you really meant, you know. Sure, I can see this. So like in strong typing, maybe to make it a policy to always, always, you know, go and qualify your column names with table names, even though the language doesn't make it a requirement, we can make it a policy between the developers. You always have to qualify. And then you simply won't run into those issues. This is a best practice. You can consider it. It's a very simple best practice. But you need to be aware of it. It's one of those things that if you're aware of them, is a simple way to get around those. You're unaware of those, you can easily get into such trouble. Yeah. If it was a schema-bound view, 
a, oh, right, so if you create a view that has a schema binding option, it forces you to, uh, well, it forces you to be explicit about uh, the schema of the table, but not the prefix of the column. Uh, yeah, I don't think it makes it mandatory. I, I will check this later on just to make sure, but I doubt that it makes it a requirement to prefix the columns. Just the, the table name has to be qualified. You are not allowed to use star. You have to be explicit about the column list, but I don't think they force you to prefix the column. Anyway, another very kind of uh, similar uh, problem in the sense that it's something that is very uh, easy not to notice, you know. So we have another situation. Couple of tables, T1, T2, our first table. You see now there are no naming issues. Both of them have a column called column one. First one has the values one, two, and null. The second one has the values two and three. Now the query says, give me the values from the second, the second table that are not in the set of values from the first, right? So what's the intuitive expected output? Three. So what most people expect is three. Erland, what do you expect? Nothing. Okay, so Erland expects nothing. So now that Erland says that he expects nothing, how many agree? Okay, very good. I, I too. So anyway, let's go ahead, recreate the tables. Then go ahead and run the code. Oh, what's up? Ah, I first need to do the dropping. This, this was a, another interesting kind of issue with the, the resolution process, that my code was resolved against the original structure of the tables and not against the new one. So normally you want to place a go after the elements that drop the table if it doesn't exist so that the new batch will be uh, evaluated and resolution of the statements will go against the new structure and not the old one. Also kind of interesting. But anyway, that's part of a different presentation. So we go run the query, and we get an empty setback. Now let's try and understand why. Yeah? What's the culprit here? The null, obviously. The uh, situation is this. SQL deals with this concept called the three-valued logic that almost everyone now knows to quote, but what does it really uh, uh, mean? We deal with predicates, and predicates like, uh, you know, column equals value you know, something like this. Uh, normally in uh, mathematics, in the predicate logic, predicates must evaluate to either true or false. Uh, predicate logic implements a concept called the law of excluded middle. Uh, any kind of uh, a logical expression will always evaluate to true or to false. Uh, but when uh, Ted Code created the relational model, initially his first draft for the relational model that was out uh, in 69, implemented the, the two-valued predicate logic, but then he thought a bit more and said, you know what, in life, sometimes values are missing for different reasons, but sometimes values are missing. And there could be cases where we need to define a relation that allows missing values in some of its attributes, right? And code came up with two types of missing values that he defined in his second draft for the relational model. And he referred to those as missing and applicable and missing and inapplicable. The missing and applicable type is, say we have an employee that has a cell phone attribute, so an employee relation with a cell phone attribute. Missing and applicable would be uh, the employee has a cell phone but doesn't want to give us the number. Maybe we didn't make it a mandatory thing, and it's not like we don't allow adding an employee row into the table if we don't know what the cell phone number is, even though we know it exists. That's missing an applicable example. Missing an inapplicable is a case where uh, the value simply isn't relevant. Let's say it's not very common these days, but uh, uh, say an employee without a cell phone. I've heard of someone that uh, actually disconnected also from email, believe it or not. I mean, today we're talking about all those uh, social media uh, forms and so on. I know of someone disconnected not only from phone, but also from email and said, you want to talk to me, come to my office, right? I have a life. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, so this is the idea that we need missing values, that we have missing values in life and we need a way to represent them in the relational model. SQL didn't implement codes to different concepts of missing values. 
If it did, you would have seen now two different marks for the two cases. Uh, and by the way, before we go to what SQL implements, there's a whole group of people that actually believes that the true valid relational model shouldn't support missing values at all. Chris Date, for example, strongly objects to the whole concept of you know, a, a, a third option or, or NADs, especially in, in SQL. And it's not like you know less or more about the relational model. You see very knowledgeable people, some believe in supporting missing values and some don't. What's important is to know how to interact with them. SQL didn't implement uh, two different marks. It implemented all, only this one null general purpose mark that we know that could represent any kind of missing value. But the problem is that the language, if it uses only one mark for missing values, there's no way for it to tell whether our intention was applicable or inapplicable. Right? So it has to make some kind of a, an assumption and stick to it, basically be consistent. So as far as SQL is concerned, whenever you compare something with a null, even another null, by the way, which is a bit tricky, even when you do where column 1 is equal to column 1, if column 1 is null, you don't get a true back. And that's what one of the arguments that people that object to nulls use. I mean, clearly, even if we don't know what the value is, it must be equal to itself. Because let's say the value is 10. We don't know that it's 10, but let's say it's 10. Then clearly, one 10 is equal to another 10. Even if it was 20, clearly a 20 is equal to another 20. But anyway, the language takes a perspective that says a null could be anything. And therefore, when you compare a null with anything, you are supposed to uh, get neither true nor false, but rather a third option that they call unknown. We simply don't know what the answer is. Now, with this in mind, the language when treating unknown cases where predicates are allowed, it's a bit inconsistent. Yeah, like in query filters, where uh, on having uh, unknowns are filtered out, much like falses are filtered out. So the way you want to think about the way query filters work is query filters accept true cases. Therefore, they reject falses and unknowns. It's not like saying accepts true and rejects false is the same thing. It's the same thing when you have two-valued logic, but not the same when you have three-valued logic. So query filters accept true, meaning they reject falses and unknowns. But I can't say, I've seen references that say a treatment of unknown is like false in a filter. That's not true either, because when you do not against false, what do you get? True. What do you get when you do not of unknown? Unknown. I usually get some people responding with known, but that's in English, correct? Not in uh, logic. Not unknown simply remains unknown. Now, as mentioned, the language is a bit inconsistent in the sense that query filters filter out unknowns. Uh, check constraints actually reject falses, which is different. So in the case of a null that re results in unknown, actually the row is accepted. But you need to simply be aware how the different language constructs deal or interact with the unknowns to know, you know, w what to expect. So sometimes the behave question? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the reference is that there are different settings in T-SQL. It's not standard, but there are different settings in T-SQL that can change the behavior of null comparison. Uh, those settings basically are there because of backward compatibility issues with very, very old systems that used non-standard behavior that was there in the language. So you can set a set option that says that when you compare something with the null, if both are nulls, you're supposed to get a true back. But it's in a deprecation path for a very good reason, relying on non-standard behavior of course, it's simply not a recommended uh, thing. So I don't know which exact version they're planning to remove. But at any rate, if there's any code that relies on all behavior, of course, it's re strongly recommended to go and replace it with programmatic elements that yield the same result. If we want to compare two nulls and consider them as equal, the right thing to do, well, according to the standard, the right thing to do is, is not distinct from. Let's say we need to compare two columns, and when both are nulls, we need to treat the comparison as equal. So according to standard SQL, instead of using equality, there is a special predicate 
that makes also two nulls be treated as equal to each other. Versus is distinct from that says null versus not null always false. Unfortunately, though, I don't know of even one database platform that implemented this very, very elegant uh, capability in the language. So for now, we have to use alternatives. The alternative that you do not want to use is this. Some use this form where they replace the uh, existing uh, uh, value if it's a null with something that you know that cannot appear in your data. For example, let's say that the element is a number and negatives are not allowed in our data. Then we have a check constraint to enforce it. And then equate with is null and then another minus one. Logically, it will produce the correct result, assuming that minus ones cannot appear in the data. The problem is with optimization, that if we were doing a join based on this kind of condition, this form prevents the optimizer from relying on index ordering. If we switch to a form that uses a one element is equal to the other, or the first element is null and the other element is null, the optimizer was actually coded with the logic to recognize this as simple equality. And then if there's indexing, utilize indexing, and so on. So anyway, but it's a performance issue. Going back to our tricky kind of uh, situation, what exactly happened here that made us get back an empty set? So think about, let's say, evaluating the value 2. First of all, let's try to think about the positive condition, yeah? The in part. Ignore the not for a moment, yeah? When we say where... 2 is in, select 1, 2, or null from the other set, can you say for sure whether 2 appears in T1? Yes, but that's exactly why you don't want to see it, right? Then we apply the not on top of the true. We get the false and we don't want to see it. Now let's try with 3. First of all, with the positive condition. Can you say for sure whether 3 is in the other set? Well, you can say for sure that it's there, but you realize that just as well you cannot say for sure that it's not there. You see the problem? The where clause looks for an absolute certainty, not for a maybe. So the in, the positive condition, yields unknown. We do not know for sure whether 3 is in that set. We, we get neither a true nor false. We simply get unknown. But then we apply the not to the unknown, and it simply remains unknown. Not unknown is unknown. So whenever something you cannot say for sure that is there, you also cannot say for sure that it's not there. Now, when does this hit us in actual uh, production cases? Take our previous example. Give me customers who place orders and just negate it. Give me customers who didn't place orders. So we say, select from customers where cast ID not in, select cast ID from orders. Now, we have occasionally a kind of internal orders that we place by our own company. And the two main ways to model the concept is, one, create a dummy customer ID for the self-company, which is what many do. Another one is to say there is no external customer tied to this order. And therefore, a null. Null, missing value, no customer. Now, we know that this is a null representing missing and inapplicable. We know. Because we didn't get a special mark for applicable versus inapplicable, we just used the general null. SQL doesn't know that it cannot be any particular customer. So it doesn't know that it needs to ignore the null and not think of it as, as if it could be any customer. You see the problem? So with this in mind, knowing exactly what's the meaning of the null, it's self-company's order that's OK then not to compare with. Uh, one of two ways for us to deal with it, either explicitly get rid of the nulls when we do the comparison, just as simple as that. And now, obviously, we will get the three. Or, remember the question about the exists? What's so special about exists? If we do exists, and then select a whatever from T T1, where the T1 a column 1 is equal to the T2.column 1, what's so different about this? Because exists, Unlike in, uses two value predicate logic. There's no unknown in exists. If the inner query that exists works with has a filter that compares a null with something, what happens with that uh, row? It's filtered out. Because null compared with anything produces unknown, and a query filter removes unknown. 
So the unknowns are removed implicitly. What we did in the in explicitly saying where column is not null, the exist will do implicitly. So therefore, we're dealing only with known cases, basically. Uh, yes, yeah, so the question is, is there a list? So, you know, in different uh, places, my books, articles, and so on, I, I do talk about this, but I don't remember collecting everything, everything, everything into this uh, one place. It uh, actually makes sense to, to come up with this kind of reference that shows where. Remind me, maybe I'll, I'll come up with something for this, yeah? Uh, and, and, and also the same thing, by the way, with null comparisons. When are two nulls considered equal versus not? Can anyone think of an example where two nulls are considered equal in the language? Sorting, any, any other place? In an index, uh, yes, that's true. But that's a kind of a tricky part. In standard SQL, when we define a unique constraint, then two nulls are not supposed to be considered equal to, to each other. So we are supposed to be allowed to enter multiple NAS, but the implementation in SQL Server is non-standard. Where, yeah, kind of a creature. So there, two NAS are actually considered equal, and that's rejected. There's a trick with filtered indexes to get around this. Another example would be a set operators. Set operators, like intersect, except they treat two NAS as equal, making it very convenient for us to check for intersection or set difference. If you compare it with doing inner joins or not exist, then their null comparison yields unknown and rows get filtered out. Right? Anyway, it's very, very tricky side of the language. It's very important to understand carefully how they're treated. So the conclusion here is this. Every piece of code you write in SQL, you want to ask yourself, are nulls possible in the data we're interacting with? Especially when the interaction is not just select, but rather compare with, group by, order by, you know, term in uniqueness, things like this. If the answer is yes, nulls are possible, like in our case, the customer ID in the inner query could be a null, then you need to make sure that you add a test. Part of your QA, you know, testing procedures needs to be a test for specifically a null. And then if the behavior is the one that is the one you want to get, sometimes, you know, it will happen to be the one that you intuitively need to get. That's okay, you verified it. If not, you add the logic. You know, like in our case, either add the where is not null or switch to not exist to make it behave the way you need it to, right? Anyway, so that's about the time we had for the session. I wanted to leave a couple of minutes for uh, questions. We have five more minutes, so I can open it to any questions at this point uh, about any of the items that we covered. Or others, yeah. Uh, so again, when we, when, uh, by the way, for those of you that uh, need to leave, then feel free. Thanks very much for attending. Enjoy the, the rest of the conference. Otherwise, I'll stay here to answer any questions, okay? So uh, if, if you could repeat. Right. So why didn't we get the biggest column one? Let me switch back to the original query. So. Oh, 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 because, because un, uh, you're, you're talking about unambiguous. I, I thought I heard biggest, yeah. So the question is, why didn't we get an error now that the, there is an ambiguous column name? And the answer is, unlike in a join, where both tables that we are querying appear in the same phase of logical query processing, and then there's clear ambiguity in which of the sides I need to obtain my element from. In a subquery, the default assumption is that we are supposed to pull the value from the inner query if it exists there. That's how the language is designed. So there was an, another suggestion, why not prevent this kind of behavior in the language? It's a good suggestion, but the problem is that that part of the language was already defined and cannot be changed. So when it's a subquery and we're hitting only one table in the inner query, if it's there, take it from there. If not, now test if it's in the outer one. So there's no issue of ambiguity now, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, so the question is, because of the two versus three valued logic, 
Do you get different execution plans, let's say, for the not in versus not exist? The way I first time years ago discovered the problem with the not in was that I couldn't explain originally why I got different plans from not in and not exist. Even though I didn't have nulls in my data, the column was defined as allowing nulls. And the optimizer recognizes these are different requests. They have different meanings. And then when I tried forcing a not null constraint, suddenly the, the plan became identical. But then, you know, after you start digging and looking why, you know, the difference that you realize it's due to the nulls, it, it makes perfect sense. So that's another reason why it's so important to enforce not null constraints when the column is not supposed to allow nulls. It helps the optimizer realize that nulls are not possible. It doesn't need to take care of this special case. And when nulls are allowed, then always, always think about whether the behavior with the null case is the one that you're supposed to get versus not. Right? Yes, yeah, so the question is, would you get a different plan for exist versus in? They actually have the same meaning in this case. So you get the same plan. But I'm saying the not part is the part that gets different meaning and therefore also different plan. Right, any other questions? Yes, please. Right, so the issue with select star versus select uh, like a constant, yeah? So here, there are two uh, aspects here. There's optimization and then there's resolution. In terms of optimization, what kind of plan you would get, you will never get a different plan when you do select star versus select one. The optimizer knows you're not really returning anything, so it's not like putting select star would prevent using an index that doesn't contain all columns. So plan is going to be identical, no different optimization, already for several good versions. You know, so it's even in 2000 already we got the uh, such a, a same treatment. The only part that differs is SQL Server needs to expand the star against metadata in the resolution phase. It's not really a, an expensive phase. It's usually an extremely negligible uh, part of the cost. But if you say, I want to save any possible cycles that I can, putting a select one will at least prevent the you know, expansion against the metadata for checking security or things like this. You know. But generally, for me, writing select one is not natural. It's just not natural. And therefore, my preference is to use a select star and saying I'm willing to pay that extra resolution cost. You know, I wish that the language actually had an exist that doesn't have a select. Not to just confuse people that uh, does it matter what I write here or not. Right? But, you know, that's how it's defined now. Right, anything else? All right, so if there are no other questions, uh, thanks very much for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.